Thanks, Peggy. Good morning, everyone. Um, so many of you know who I am. Uh, I'm the staff coordinator for professional standards for CAR. And um, I teach a six hour long class for professional standards administrators. Uh, today we have one hour. And so I'm going to try to condense some of that material down. But I'm not necessarily going to be able to get into all of the details I would be able to get into for the six hour training. So I recommend that if any of you are actually interested in becoming certified as a professional standards administrator that you talk to Peggy and she can get you information about uh, how to actually take that training on demand. Because we actually just had it earlier this month in March, uh, but it is available on an on-demand basis for anyone that needs to take it. Uh, but today, what I, I really want to do is just kind of give you a general overview of professional standards and answer any burning questions that you may have about it. And uh, we'll, we'll try to get through that in an hour. That's, that's the plan. And I have a, a PowerPoint presentation to share as well. So I'm going to begin sharing my screen. There we go. So my first slide, I have a graphic that represents the entire professional standards process. And really the first question is, what do we mean by professional standards at the association? There's actually two processes that make up professional standards. There are arbitrations and then there are ethics complaints. I actually wanna start off with the ethics complaints on the right because those tend to be more common than arbitrations. So you'll notice at the top of the ethics complaint tree that we have a picture of handcuffs. Now that doesn't mean the association is actually going to go and arrest anyone, but the point of the, the, uh, of the picture is that an ethics complaint arises because someone alleges that one of your members has broken the rules and needs to be punished. So of course that raises the question, which rules are we talking about that can subject you to an ethics complaint? And there are actually three sets of rules that can subject someone to a complaint under this process. Number one, the code of ethics. And I'll talk a little bit more about the code of ethics later. Um, they are published by NAR and all realtor members agree to abide by them when they join a local association of realtors. There are 17 articles of the code of ethics. If a realtor is found to have violated one of those articles, then they can be disciplined through this process. The next set of rules are the rules of the MLS. And so when someone joins the MLS, they also agree to abide by the rules of that MLS. And most MLS rules contain a provision saying that if someone is found to have violated the MLS rules, they can be subject to a hearing that takes place through the uh, local association disciplinary process. Now, when I go through this part, I do like to indicate that there are some local associations that um, have a relationship with an MLS that handles MLS violations separately through their own process. That's relatively uncommon. So uh, you'll have to check to see if you have an arrangement with your MLS where, where the MLS takes care on their own of all MLS violations. But for most associations, if there is an allegation of an MLS rule violation, that can also be handled through the ethics complaint process. And then finally, we have uh, membership duties. And membership duties are any duties that are set forth in the bylaws of the association. Um, and rarely will you see a membership duty alleged in, in an ethics complaint, but it can happen sometimes. One of the most common membership duties that's separate from the code of ethics itself would be an allegation that someone has misused the realtor trademark. So there's nothing in the code of ethics about the proper use of the realtor mark, but it is in the, the bylaw. So if someone is found to be misusing the realtor mark, then that could also subject them to a disciplinary hearing. So those are the three sets of rules, code of ethics, MLS rules, membership duties. So if someone thinks that a realtor has violated one of those sets of rules, what can they do? And well, before we even ask that, the question is who can actually file a complaint against uh, against a member? And the answer to that question is essentially anyone can file a complaint. Um, a member of the public, another realtor, a client of the realtor, there's even no um, obligation that the person who files a complaint has any kind of contractual relationship with the realtor. So occasionally we'll see cases where um, a realtor is working with an elderly client. 
And the, the son or daughter of that elderly client feels like the realtor is maybe doing something to take advantage of that client. So the son or daughter can choose to file the ethics complaint. And you might say, well, the son or daughter doesn't have any contractual relationship with the realtor. Does that matter? The answer is no, because anyone is actually allowed to file that ethics complaint. Anyone who wants to and believes that a realtor has committed a violation. So of course, of course, the first step is someone calls up the association and lets you know that they want to file a complaint. Um, they can do so as long as the person who is being complained of is a member of your association. And what I want to make clear here is they can be either a primary or a secondary member. So you have jurisdiction over both types of members, primary and secondary. Uh, sometimes I'll get questions saying they're, they're filing at my association, but this person is only a secondary member here. Should I transfer the case to the primary association? The answer is no, you have jurisdiction over someone who is your secondary member. So there's absolutely no problem with you conducting the hearing. So the next step, of course, is giving the person uh, the uh, formal ethics complaint form, which they'll have to fill out and provide to the association. The administrator will review the ethics complaint to make sure that it's been filled out properly. And if it is, then it will be sent forward to the next stage, which is the grievance committee. And the grievance committee is a standing committee of the association made up of uh, realtor volunteers. And the job of the grievance committee is to screen the ethics complaint to make sure that there is a possible violation alleged. So the grievance committee will review the materials that were submitted by the complainant and decide, is there a possible violation here? If so, we should send it forward for a hearing. Or they may decide, you know, there's no, there's no possible violation. There's no reason to have a hearing. Therefore, we're going to choose to dismiss the complaint. So that's kind of the main decision that the grievance committee makes. They, there's a couple of other things they look at too. They look at the allegations made in the complaint to make sure that the allegations match up with the description of the violation. So any ethics complaint that it is submitted has to include an attached exhibit one where the complainant explains in, in essentially a narrative form what they believe happened that uh, led to the violation. So the grievance committee has to make sure that the narrative matches up with the allegations on that complaint form. Another thing that the grievance committee does is make sure that the proper respondents have been made. And so to be clear, there are the two sides in the ethics complaint process are the complainant and the respondent. Those are the, the two sides. The complainant is the person who files a complaint. The respondent is the person who is responding to the complaint. And so the, the respondent, of course, is the one who is going to be uh, on trial, essentially. It's not really a trial, but it's essentially a private trial that we have as a hearing. And so um, we can add additional respondents besides the one that the complainant named. Sometimes a complainant will only name an agent and the grievance committee feels like maybe the broker failed to adequately supervise the agent and the broker should also be named as well. So if the grievance committee sends a complaint forward, then the next step is scheduling a hearing. And so the parties are notified that there's a complaint that's going to be moving forward for a hearing and the names of the potential panelists are then given to the parties. And the parties have the opportunity to challenge potential panel members for a cause. Um, also, there's a, a date range that's usually sent out to the parties, and we ask them, you know, what dates within this date range are you not available for a hearing? And then the association will select a date when both parties say they are available, and then we'll notice the actual hearing date at least 21 days in advance of the hearing. Then we get to the hearing itself, and a hearing is, like I said, essentially a trial. So the way that it works is both parties attend the hearing. And right now, sometimes that attendance is done virtually via Zoom. But it used to be and will, again, be in the future done in person as well. And uh, the parties will come and present all of their evidence and witness testimony. And the hearing panel will decide on what the outcome of the case is going to be. The hearing panel is typically a panel of three realtor volunteers on the association's professional standards committee. So this is where the pro standards committee comes in. They're also a standing committee of the association whose members are, are chosen by the president to, to serve for this purpose, to be panelists in ethics complaint and arbitration cases. So the panelists will conduct the hearing, make sure that both sides have the opportunity to fully and fairly present their case. And then after the hearing is over, they'll go off and deliberate and decide on what the outcome is going to be. And in a disciplinary hearing, that outcome in includes two parts. First of all, the hearing panel has to decide um, 
of all of the allegations alleged in the complaint, what violations are actually found in terms of what the respondent did to uh, violate the code of ethics, MLS duties, or uh, MLS rules, or membership duties. Second step, if there are any violations, the hearing panel has to decide what discipline is going to be recommended. So there are seven types of discipline that NAR permits the, uh, a hearing panel to recommend for violations. And so the hearing panel can choose to recommend any combination of those forms of discipline. Now, once that decision is reached, I want to make it very clear, and I, I sometimes think associations forget this. What the hearing panel decides is always considered a recommendation under NAR policy, which means the case is never final until the board of directors has acted on it. So after the hearing panel has reached its decision, the rule is that the parties are given the decision and they have 20 days to request a review before the board of directors if they wish to do so. So let's do the first situation. What happens if neither party sends in a request for review? In that situation, the case isn't done yet. In order to finalize it, you need to provide the decision to the board of directors for a ratification. And that can either be done by your full board or just a panel of your board of directors. So uh, a, a selection of your board of directors members can conduct the ratification. The ratification involves just reading the decision of the hearing panel and the recommendation of discipline. And after reading through that, the directors will decide to either adopt the hearing panel's decision or recommend modifications. On the other hand, sometimes one of the parties will request a review of the decision. In that case, you have to schedule an actual review hearing. Now the review hearing will be conducted by a panel of members of your local association board of directors. And it's actually a full due process hearing where both sides can attend the hearing. There are actually three grounds for review of an, an ethics decision. And those are um, misinterpretation or misapplication of an article or MLS rule. Number two, an allegation that the association has violated a party's due process rights. And we'll talk about due process a little later on. Or number three, an allegation that the discipline recommended by the hearing panel was too excessive. So the person requesting the review can request on any of those three grounds or all of those three grounds, depending on what their argument is going to be. And then a review hearing is conducted where the parties can attend and make their arguments solely related to the basis for review. Following the review hearing, the directors can decide to either adopt the hearing panel's original decision, they can recommend modifications to the decision, uh, they can dismiss the case entirely if they think that's appropriate, or they can send the case back for a new hearing if they feel the procedures followed at the initial hearing were not proper. So th those are all the actions. If that latter uh, uh, action is taken, then we go back to the pro standards hearing panel stage and we basically start that process over again. So that's a very condensed version of the uh, ethics complaint process. Now I, I want to move over to the left-hand side, to the arbitration side. And so arbitrations are monetary disputes. That's why we have dollar signs at the top of the arbitration tree. Now, one of the most common misconceptions about arbitrations is that Associations will often think that any time you have a member that's contacting you saying they have a dispute, that it can be subject to arbitration through the professional standards process. But that's usually not true. Association arbitrations are very limited to certain circumstances. I'm actually going to talk about the jurisdiction for arbitrations on the next slide. But if it is a dispute that can be arbitrated through the association, uh, the uh, process is very similar. So it begins by the complainant, the person who is requesting money from the respondent. They must fill out an arbitration complaint. When they're filling out that complaint, they can also request mediation. And I'll talk about mediation a little later on. But mediation is voluntary at most associations. That's a more informal process of trying to resolve the dispute. If mediation failed or the parties don't want mediation, then we immediately move forward to conducting a hearing. And again, that hearing is conducted by members of the Pro Standards Committee. And uh, both parties attend the hearing and can make their arguments. So the complainant will uh, argue that they're entitled to money from the respondent and the respondent will argue that the complainant is not entitled to money from the respondent. Following the conclusion of the arbitration hearing, the arbitrators can make a decision and their decision is limited solely as to whether they are going to award money to the complainant or not. 
Um, and they can also reimburse some of the costs of arbitration as long as those costs were requested in writing from the prevailing party. Following the decision of the hearing panel there, um, again, the parties are given the decision and they have 20 days to request a review. Now for arbitrations, if nobody requests a review, the directors don't have to take any action on it. The decision simply becomes final after the period to request a review has lapsed. On the other hand, if a party does request a review, then a director's review hearing is held. And that's done the same way as for a disciplinary review hearing. The, the key difference is there's only one grounds on which to request a review of uh, a, an arbitration hearing, and that is lack of procedural due process. So the only thing that gets discussed in arbitration review is due process, and the decision after the review hearing is either to uphold the arbitration award or send it back for a new hearing. Those are the only two options. So the arbitration process, pretty similar to the ethics complaint process, except that we take the grievance committee out of it. The Grievance Committee doesn't have a role for arbitrations. Besides that, it's relatively similar. Um, and also the, the other key difference is that the directors don't have to act on the arbitration award for it to become a final, unless there is a director's review requested. So now let me talk about the, the jurisdiction for arbitrations, because this is a question that I get all the time from local associations. So arbitrators decide as a question of law who is entitled to money. And typically the most common type of dispute that's arbitrated through the association is a procuring cause commission dispute. Procuring cause disputes arise when you have um, two different realtors claim that they're entitled to the buyer side commission. So usually you'll have um, a, an agent, uh, we'll call them the intro agent, who started working with a buyer, usually showed a property to that buyer, and then sometimes even submitted an offer to purchase the property on behalf of that buyer. But then the buyer later on um, ends up submitting an offer from a different realtor, and that's the realtor that ends up getting the commission. Sometimes that realtor is the listing agent and the listing agent ends up double ending it, or sometimes it's a different cooperating agent. It, it could, either of those could be a procuring cause dispute. Either way, that first agent, the, the intro agent, can file a procuring cause arbitration complaint claiming, I was actually the procuring cause of this sale. I'm the one who took the necessary steps to bring it about. And therefore, I'm the one who's really entitled to the commission. So that's a very common type of arbitrable dispute. If you get a dispute like that, it is definitely subject to arbitration at the association. So arbitration, the obligation to arbitrate disputes arises from Article 17 of the Code of Ethics. And Article 17 says a dispute is arbitrable by the association if, first of all, it's between two realtor members and includes either a contractual dispute between the parties to a contract or certain specified non-contractual issues set forth in Standard of Practice 17-4. I'm not going to go through all those non-contractual issues. Let me just tell you procuring cause is by far the most common one there. For a contractual issue, this one is what trips people up sometimes. It has to be a contract between the two realtors. So sometimes the association will get an inquiry from a member saying, um, there's, there's a dispute re regarding the, the earnest money deposit uh, pursuant to the residential purchase agreement. Now, the residential purchase agreement is a contract, but it's not a contract between the realtors. It's a contract between the buyer and the seller. So disputes pursuant to the RPA are not arbitrated through the professional standards process. Now, CAR has a separate program, a for-profit program called consumer mediation. And we have mediators that can handle uh, the mediation of those disputes for a charge. So um, when you get inquiries related to that, you can certainly let uh, your members know about consumer mediation and send them to the website, which is car.org slash mediation. But those are not the kinds of disputes that are going to be mediated through professional standards. Additionally, NAR has limited the types of claims that can be arbitrated. So on this slide, I've included a list of different types of claims that cannot be arbitrated through the association. One of the most common ones that we'll get inquiries about are when listing agents claim that their listing agreement is in being interfered with by another realtor. That could be tortious interference with a contractual relationship or a business relationship. But NAR has said that even though that would be a valid claim in court, those are not the kinds of disputes that are covered under the Article 17 duty to arbitrate. So um, even though it is a dispute between two realtors, it's not arbitrable with the association and the parties would have to handle that type of dispute in a court of law instead of through the association. 
All right, so I can take uh, some questions now before we move on to the next section. Actually, Brian, you're very thorough. There aren't any questions except people want to make sure that they're going to be able to get the slides after the presentation. Absolutely. <laughs> That's an easy question. <laughs> All right, so next thing I wanna to talk to you about are the materials that are available to help you with all of that. So I know that, and like, like Peggy said, that was, that was very thorough, and there's no way you're going to remember all of that if this is the first time you're hearing it. So someone you know, wants, calls you up and say, I want to file a complaint, and you're like, well, what is my next step? We, we have a lot of materials that are available to help you out. First of all, let me talk about the materials from NAR briefly. NAR provides us with the code of ethics itself. So the code of ethics, as I said, consists of 17 articles divided into three sections. We've got duties to clients, duties to the public, and duties to other realtors. And these are the rules that cannot be broken. If someone alleges that the realtor has violated those rules, that's what can subject them to a complaint. So as I said, you can find the code of ethics on the NAR website. We also link to it on the CAR website, but they're published by NAR. Besides the articles themselves um, and the full code of ethics, most of the articles are followed by one or more standards of practice. And the standards of practice are there to support and explain the articles because the articles of the code of ethics tend to be very broad duties. And the standards of practice kind of narrow it down and say, this is how these particular broad duties would be applied to particular conduct. So for example, article one is the broad duty that realtors have to protect and promote their, the interests of their clients. And one of the standards of practice under Article 1 is that you have to present all offers to your client in a timely and an objective manner. So that's saying, you know, here's the standard of practice. This is something that you have to do to protect and promote your client's interest, which is the article itself. So the standards of practice help to explain how we actually um, execute those duties in practice. Now, the standards of practices in and of themselves cannot be violated. But they can certainly be used uh, both in hearings and in findings of fact prepared by hearing panels to explain the decision of, uh, uh, of what the hearing panel is doing. Finally, the last material coming from NAR are case interpretations. And these are hypothetical situations made up by NAR to illustrate and explain how the articles of the Code of Ethics are applied to particular conduct. Um, NAR uh, associates, each, associates each case interpretation with a particular article of the Code of Ethics. So if you go to the NAR website and search for case interpretations, you can read, you, you know, they have links for case interpretation for each article of the Code of Ethics. And they can be used for a couple of purposes. First of all, they can be used by parties during hearings and by panels to analogize to the, uh, the actual case in front of them. And so a hearing panel can say, you know, this case is very similar to the hypothetical case interpretation, and NAR says that this is how the hypothetical panel should rule in that case, therefore we should rule in the same way. And NAR says that's one of the purposes of the case interpretations. They can be used for that purpose. I'd say more often the case interpretations are used for educational purposes. So when I'm teaching on the code of ethics, I'll often use case interpretations to illustrate how the code of ethics gets applied in particular situations. So in that way, they're somewhat similar to the standards of practice. All right, but now uh, I'm gonna spend a little more time talking about what materials we have from CAR. And CAR, we have everything related to the procedures that need to be followed to carry out professional standards proceedings. This link that I'm providing you right here is a key link that if you are involved at all in professional standards, you really need to bookmark because a lot of times I'll have people say, you know, I was trying to find something related to pro standards and I used the search tool and I, I couldn't find it that way. And we try to improve the search tool on the CIR website, but it's not always perfect. Most of the things that you need related to pro standards are actually at this link. So, so better to bookmark this link rather than to use the search tool. A couple of things, and I'm actually going to show you everything on the page in a moment, but uh, some of the key things are the California Code of Ethics and Arbitration Manual. These are the rules that need to be followed when conducting professional standards procedures in California. Now, California publishes its own code of ethics and arbitration manual. It's different than NAR's. California procedures are different than the national procedures. So uh, anyone in California should be using the California manual and not the NAR manual. So I, I do wanna keep, make that clear. 
Um, we also publish implementation guidelines, which are helper sections to help you understand what uh, the actual rules in the manual are saying. And we publish these implementation guidelines specifically for association staff. So if you go through the manual and you still can't find an answer, you should check out the implementation guidelines as well. So let's take a look now. I'm going to X out of my PowerPoint and I wanna show you everything on this Pro Standards Materials page because I think it's, it's pretty important. Um, so, all right. Can everyone see uh, my, my screen right now? Yes. I, I'll show you, okay, good. All right, so this is the uh, CAR homepage. So where you can find everything related to Pro Standards is first of all, under Industry 360. So I know that's not immediately intuitive, but yeah, this is where all the Pro Standards stuff is. So first, the first uh, tab is market data, but then the second tab is MLS slash Pro Standards. And so this is where all the links related to MLS and Pro Standards issues can be found. At this first link, you can find everything related to the MLS rules. Um, we have the page where we publish the code of ethics violators. That's definitely worth checking out. We have the link to the NIR code of ethics. We have online training for professional standards volunteers. So I do live training for volunteers. Um, this, this year I did that uh, early on in the year, but if you have volunteers that still need to be trained throughout the year, we have these online training modules that you can have them take. It's, it's $35 per course. Um, then we have the Pro Standards Materials page, which I'll click on in a moment. Next, we have the page for CAR interboard arbitrations. So the interboard arbitration program takes place when you have an arbitration and the two parties uh, don't belong to the same local associations of realtors. And when we talk about the parties in an arbitration, we're talking about the brokers because the brokers are the actual parties in interest in the arbitration. So if the two brokers, the complainant and the respondent don't share any local associations in common, you can forward the complainant to the CAR, CAR interboard arbitration program. And we have separate interboard arbitration rules and actually CAR will handle the processing of that arbitration. Um, this is the email address for that, iba at car.org. And there's a, a complaint form and associated documents that people can download. So the, or again, this is in situations where you have dispute between um, parties belonging to different local associations. Next, we have professional standards administrator certification. I talked about this a little more, but anyone who is going to be a pro standards administrator at the local association needs to get certified according to NAR policy, and you need to get recertified every four years. So I teach live versions of this training twice a year, but it's available on demand at the same fee that it costs to take the live training at any time. So if you have new staff members joining throughout the year, they can take it at any time during the year. Um, just uh, Again, you can talk to Peggy and Peggy can send you the right place, or you can email uh, Annie Collins, who's one of our administrative assistants in the, uh, in the corporate legal department. And her email is Annie C, A-N-N-I-E-C at car.org. Um, this is a link to all of the professional standards webinars that we've done uh, throughout the past many years. Um, the webinars right now are, sort, are sorted by alphabetical order, which I know is not ideal. We're going to try to, to resort the webinars maybe at a later point, but the, everything that you need in terms of webinars is available here. Um, and you can scroll along and see all of them. We have um, everyday ethics webinars. We have a webinar about the new standard of practice 10-5 at the very end here. We have a webinar about procuring cause factors. We have a webinar about how to write findings of fact. So all of this will be very useful if you need uh, to train your volunteers on various aspects related to the code of ethics. We have resources for hearings via Zoom. If you're conducting any hearings by Zoom right now, this is a good link to have. Uh, we have mediator training for realtors, which is coming up in uh, June. If you have anyone at your association that might be interested in becoming a mediator, let them know about this. They can sign up for the mediator training, which we have conducted by some amazing trainers from the, the Pepperdine Law School. I, I took the training last time we had it in 2018, and I, I can tell you it's exceptional. So uh, definitely recommended for any of your members that are thinking about becoming a mediator or an ombudsman. 
because this is the same training that's necessary for anyone that wants to be an ombudsman. Um, and then uh, we have pro standards train the trainer materials. So this is for uh, anyone at your local association that wants to be able to do live trainings for volunteers. So like I said, I do those trainings, but I can't necessarily cover all of the local associations. And so I have uh, realtor volunteers and local association staff become pro standards trainers. And I, I will train you how to be your own trainer for the volunteers. So if you're interested in that, I do that at the beginning of every year in January. All right, so that's a lot. I know it's a lot, but this is the, the tab, everything related to pro standards, you find it here. But I think the, main, the most important page is this pro standards materials page. And so take a look at everything you can find here. This is the link to resources related to Zoom hearings and some NAR materials about how to handle pro standards enforcement in the uh, current COVID environment. Next, we have all of our uh, standard materials. So. First, forms. We have links to all of the forms related to arbitrations and mediations, and all of the forms related to disciplinary and grievance matters. So you can see when you click on that, you get a list of all of the forms. They're available in both PDF and Word documents for each one. And for some of the forms, we even created versions if you're doing remote hearings, you can use instead of the standard versions of the forms. So lots of options here. Then we have processing checklists. These are very, very important. You need to know where these are because anytime you get a complaint, you can click on the checklist and it will tell you step-by-step -step what you need to do procedurally to handle the complaint. So let's say you have a disciplinary complaint and your association doesn't have ethics advocates. You can click on the PDF or Word version of this processing checklist and it will show you exactly what you need to do, step-by-step, -step, a checklist. And we have references to everywhere in the manual and the associated documents uh, in terms of additional information that you might need for each step of the process. So this is extremely helpful. I recommend printing out and using a checklist every single time you get a complaint. And so we have checklists for each step of the process. So this is the initial complaint process. We have checklists for the review process. Um, for MLS citations, there's a citation reconsideration process. It's new for 2021. We have a checklist for that as well. And then these checklists are for the mediation and arbitration process. Next on the page, we have the cooperative enforcement agreement. This is an agreement that will need to be signed between two associations when one association is conducting a hearing involving a member of a different association. There may be several situations in where that needs to happen. For example, um, the respondent in a particular case may be someone who's, for example, the president of your association. And so it may be impossible for there to be a fair hearing that takes place at your association. And so your association will sign a cooperative enforcement agreement saying, you know, we, we are allowing you to actually conduct the professional standards proceeding and we will agree to enforce whatever uh, discipline is recommended or whatever arbitration award is recommended by your association's process. And so this is the contract, uh, a template contract that you can uh, click on and, and use in those situations. And next we have all the manuals and guidelines. So we have the California Code of Ethics and Arbitration Manual, which I mentioned before, then the two implementation guidelines. We have the procuring cause guidelines. These are what you should give to a hearing panel anytime there is a procuring cause arbitration dispute. It's the factors that the hearing panel needs to take into account when they're making their decision. Next, we have the appendices. These include a lot of other important information. Uh, it includes all of the uh, processing checklists, which are available as separate documents here. It also includes sample cover letters and, and other kinds of letters that you can send throughout the process and also additional FAQ documents related to pro standards. So this, this is a pretty useful document for you to you know, possibly just download and have available uh, on your, your desktop or in a folder where it's easily accessible. Next, we have the findings of fact drafting guide. This is a guide that can be used by hearing panels when they have to draft the findings of fact after a disciplinary decision. And this is a guide that includes checklists and templates and the templates are actual language that hearing panels can use when they're trying to explain why a, uh, a respondent in a disciplinary case either violated or didn't violate the code of ethics. 
Next, we have general information about the Ethics Advocate Program. So Ethics Advocates are an optional program local associations can have. They're trained members of the association's professional standards committee. And if requested by a party, they can help the party throughout the entire process, including helping them prep their complaint or response. Uh, it also can include helping them um, at the hearing and actually helping to represent them at the hearing and also assisting a party during the review stage of, of the process. So it's, it's a good program to have. Uh, I think we're reaching the stage where about half of the associations in California have an ethics advocate program. Uh, but for those associations that don't, uh, you can always pass a motion to adopt this. And so this sheet is about optional professional standards programs that are available. Uh, it explains what each of these programs are and it gives you sample motion language if you want to adopt those programs. So anonymous complaint subcommittees, mandatory mediation. I don't have time to go through all of these right now, but these are the various optional programs that you could have on the local level. And here's what you can do to adopt those programs. One of the optional programs is the ethics citation policy. Um, this is a way for the grievance committee to issue fines without having conduct a full hearing. I, I don't have time to go into the details, but uh, again, this is another optional program for local associations. And if you want more information, there are additional documents that you can find on. And then we have links to various NAR resources, code of ethics, case interpretations, and other, other things as well. And then we have internal links to the Pro Standards Administrator Certification, Train the Trainer, and Interboard Arbitration. So like I said, key page to bookmark. Most of what you'll need related to Pro Standards can be found here. And if you still don't know the answer after going through these materials, I'm always available for an email or, or phone consultation. So. Um, might as well give out my email right now. It's brianp at car.org, B-R-I-A-N-P at car.org. And uh, my phone number, um, which I, I'm sure Peggy can share later as well, is 213-739-8381. Um, please don't give my phone number out to uh, the members. I, I will answer questions from association staff, but uh, members uh, shouldn't be contacting me directly for uh, legal or, or ethics guidance. All right, so that covers the website. Any any questions before I move on here? Yes, Brian, we do have a question from Wayland. He'd okay. like you to go over um, what, medi what mediations an association should not hold, for instance, disputes between buyers and sellers. Right, well, I, I think that that's, covers the main one that we, we usually get. Um, buyer versus seller disputes are, are not heard through uh, association pro standards. Uh, mediation or arbitration. Like I said, we have the separate program. I can actually show you that. This is the uh, CAR Consumer Mediation Center. And this is when there is a dispute between buyers and sellers, as well as other parties to real estate transactions. So sometimes the um, agents, the realtors can be included in this mediation but it is primarily about disputes related to the residential purchase agreement, the RPA, and buyer versus seller disputes. So definitely have this uh, URL available and you can send people here when they have a buyer versus seller dispute that, that needs to be mediated. This is the page for it, but it's not related to pro standards. This is an entirely separate program that is run through our, our for-profit subsidiary. Any other questions? That's the only one so far, thanks. Sure. All right, I had a feeling I'd start running short on time, so I'll have to go quickly through the rest of the slides. So just a little bit more about uh, early dispute resolution programs that we have. Um, first is the Ombudsman program. This is for the early resolution of ethics matters. Um, CAR has a statewide Ombudsman hotline that you can refer people to when they have an, an issue and like an ongoing issue with a realtor. The Ombudsman hotline is both for members of the public and for realtors that have disputes with other realtors. So the Ombudsman will talk to the person that has the issue, 
figure out what they need. Sometimes they just need information, but sometimes they need the ombudsman to call up the realtor that they're, ha that they're having an issue with. Um, now, some local associations have their own ombudsman, and that's fine. You can use your own ombudsman, but uh, the statewide ombudsman hotline is available for anyone in California to use besides the, the local ombudsman. Um, did I see another? Is there another question about that? Not in the chat, Brian. Oh, okay. I thought I saw something pop up. Okay. And then mediation is our other way of resolving matters early, but mediation is for matters that would go to arbitration. So as I said, mediation is voluntary for most associations. Um, it is mandatory for certain associations that have decided to adopt mandatory mediation. NAR allows local associations to do that, but most in California have it. If mediation is mandatory, that means that the association will not conduct an arbitration hearing until the parties have tried to mediate the dispute first. For most associations, it's voluntary. And what you should always do is give the parties the request for mediation form and see if they're interested in mediating the dispute. Uh, if they are, you can schedule the mediation. Uh, you'll get a volunteer mediator um, who hopefully will have taken the, uh, the Pepperdine mediation training that we offer. And um, the mediator will conduct a, a mediation um, conference where the parties come and they try to reach a settlement. And if they do reach a settlement agreement, that will be a binding contract that both sides sign. Um, and if that happens, then you don't have to conduct an arbitration. Now, if the mediation settlement agreement is breached, for example, if a party agrees to pay a different party pursuant to the settlement agreement and they don't do so, that enforcement of the settlement agreement is not handled at the association. That would have to be handled in court because that would be a breach of contract issue and would be handled as a lawsuit. So next thing I want to talk about ramifications of what happens when you're found in violation of the code of ethics. So first of all, CAR has a program where we publish certain ethics violators on the CAR website. We publish all ethics violations that result in a letter of reprimand, a fine, a suspension, or an expulsion. And we use information contained in the statewide database um, called ethics check to determine which cases need to be published. So I really want to encourage any of you um, that uh, you know, if you're an AE and you don't have access to ethics check, you need to get access because CAR policy is that all cases, both ethics and arbitration cases need to be input into this statewide database ethics check. And so if you're a pro standards administrator, you need to get access to ethics check and enter in information about your cases in the ethics check. And when you log in ethics check, there's a red button that says need help entering a case. And that will explain to you how you enter information about cases in the ethics check. So please do that. We need full compliance with all associations in California using ethics check. So that's the information that allows us to know with CAR when we have a case that's subject to publication. And we publish a summary of the violation and the, the photo of the violator for a period of three years. Another ramification of being found in violation is that the association can charge an administrative processing fee of up to $500. That's only if the association has adopted the policy. Um, and that's charged in addition to any fine that is assessed by the hearing panel. Uh, another use of ethics check, which I just mentioned before, is that a, a hearing panel must be given information about any prior violations of the respondent. Um, and so you can get that information by conducting a search and ethics check using the respondent's DRE number, and it will show whether they have any prior violations in California. And that information can be provided to the hearing panel to let them know. And if they, there are prior violations, the panel may decide to up the level of discipline for someone who's a repeat violator. And then finally, we have uh, breaches of the public trust. And these are violations that have to be reported to the DRE. Uh, the definition of a public trust violation was recently changed by NAR. The definition now is stealing from a client, a discrimination against the protected classes under Article 10, or fraud. So if any of those are part of the ethics violation, then the hearing panel should recommend that the violation be reported to the DRE. And if they do, they have to remember to indicate this on the D12 form where they're recommending discipline. All right, any questions before I move on to uh, the last section? So far, so good. Thanks, Brian. All right. 
All right, let's do this last part in the, the last 10 minutes here. So some more items related to pro standards. Confidentiality is a, is a subject that gets brought up all the time. Confidentiality of pro standards matters is actually a membership duty. It's set forth in Article 14 of the Code of Ethics. So standard of practice 14-2 says that realtors have a duty to keep all allegations and findings of professional standards matters confidential. So part of confidentiality means that volunteers engaging in pro standards um, enforcement shouldn't be discussing the case with anyone else. They can't even discuss it with other volunteers that are serving on different committees or different panels. Uh, now information about cases is shared through formal documentation um, and through the formal channels that are allowed through the process, but discussions outside of that are not per permitted and could violate Article 14. Also, because of confidentiality, it's a bad idea for directors to be on either the Grievance or Pro Standards Committee, but some smaller associations, it does happen. And it's okay as long as you don't have the director serving at two levels on the same case. So if you have a director that serves on a grievance panel in one case, they can't serve on a review panel in the same case. Definitely, there's no overlap between grievance and Pro Standards Committee members. I talked a little bit about due process before because that's uh, one of the bases for challenging um, a, a professional standards hearing, both a disciplinary hearing or an arbitration. And these are the five key elements to due process. So right to a full and fair hearing means that both parties have to have the opportunity to present all of the relevant evidence that they have and the panel must be um, alert and actually able to process and evaluate all the evidence fairly. The panel has to be impartial. So another way of saying that is unbiased. So there's a couple of steps we take to make sure of that. Remember that we give the parties a list of possible panel members and they can challenge potential panel members for cause. In addition to that, we, we have the panel members sign qualification statements where they say, I'm not, um, sorry, disqualified for any of the bases that are set forth on this form and no objective third party would have any reason to think that I'm biased. So we take these steps just to make sure that our hearing panels are as unbiased as possible. Next, the respondent has to have knowledge of the charges against him or her. So we do that by making sure the respondent always has a copy of the complaint. And anytime the complaint gets amended, they have to have a copy of that amended complaint. The respondent always has to have an opportunity to defend him or herself. So besides knowing what the charges are, that also means being able to attend the hearing. So we always provide the 21 days advance notice of the hearing and um, we allow the parties to say within a certain date range when they're unavailable. Um, and then we still give, and occasionally this happens, the, the right of parties to request a continuance. And a continuance means a postponement. So if something comes up and they're not able to attend the hearing on the scheduled date, they can ask for a continuance. Now the first continuance is at no charge, but subsequent continuances, um, the association can charge a continuance fee in order to uh, deter the abuse of the continuance process. And then finally, the right to an attorney. So parties in both disciplinary and arbitration hearings have the right to counsel throughout the entire process. Um, not only is the attorney allowed to be present during the hearing, they're allowed to ask questions and zealously represent their client at the hearing. So next, a proper respondents in a disciplinary case. As I said, any member of the local board where the complaint is filed, and that means both primary members and secondary members, as long as they're a member of your association, they're a proper respondent. When the salesperson is named as a respondent, the designated realtor may, but does not need to be named as a respondent. So the DR is usually the, the broker uh, of record, but doesn't necessarily have to be. The D, DR and broker have different definitions, which I don't really have time to get into right here, but whoever the DR is, they can be added, the broker can be added as well. And there's a new form D15 that grievance committees and hearing panels use to determine when it's appropriate to name the DR as a respondent and to actually find them in violation based on the actions of the salesperson. And then finally, any member of an MLS who joins the MLS through your particular association can be the proper respondent if a violation of an MLS rule is alleged. So the proper venue for a disciplinary case is either where the respondent is a member, but it can also be where the property is located. So sometimes they will be filed where the property is located, even though the um, person who's being filed against isn't a member of your association. The manual still allows you to conduct the hearing, but you'll need to get a cooperative enforcement agreement with the respondent's primary association. 
So remember back on the pro standards materials page, I showed you the link to that cooperative enforcement agreement. That This is a situation where that would come into play. You'll have to make sure to get that signed between the two associations in, in that circumstance. And then finally, we have the time limitations for filing complaints. So a complaint meeting all filing requirements for disciplinary complaint has to be filed within 180 days after the facts constituting the matter complained of could have been known in the exercise of reasonable diligence or 180 days after the conclusion of the transaction or event, whichever is later. So this is where the 180 day filing requirement comes in. So this is a filing requirement. It doesn't mean that the actual hearing will take place within 180 days, but the initial complaint has to be filed within those 180 days. If it's not, then the complaint can't be accepted by the association. So one thing we make clear here, when the party utilizes the ombudsman program, the filing deadline is suspended until the case is reported closed by the ombudsman. Because we don't wanna deter people from using the ombudsman out of fear that, you know, if I use an ombudsman, then I'll lose my chance to actually file a complaint. And then finally, for arbitrations, we also have a 180-day filing deadline. It's either 180 days after the close of the transaction or the time the facts constituting the matter uh, complained of could have been known by the complainant in the exercise of reasonable diligence. So typically in an arbitration commission dispute, um, the uh, complainant will know pretty much as soon as close of ask that there's going to be a dispute. So typically that's the, the that's the, uh, the um, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Um, what we're using to decide, you know, when does the 180 days start? Um, it will usually be at the close of the transaction. There may be occasional cases where the dispute only arises later after the transaction. And if that's the case, it's 180 days after that. Um, now, when if ever there is a dispute about the timing of the, the filing, whether for a disciplinary complaint or for an arbitration, um, now, if it's obvious, the association should just say, you know, this matter is closed. You know, you clearly didn't file in time. But if there's an, a, a potentially valid argument, then that needs to be sent forward and it needs to be addressed by the hearing panel at a pre-hearing. And so when I call it a pre-hearing, it's done on the same date as the hearing and by the same hearing panel. But it, I just mean that they address this first before anything else is addressed. And then the hearing panel will decide whether it's filed timely, in which case they move forward with the hearing, or it hasn't been filed timely, in which case they dismiss the case. So that's how it's handled when there's a dispute related to the timeliness of the filing. So there's so much more I could say about professional standards process. Like I said, the full training is about five hours. So you're just getting a taste of it right now. Um, but that's uh, all I have time for today. So we have a few minutes left. If there are any more questions, I would be happy to answer them right now. And uh, like I said, I'll be giving uh, this uh, PowerPoint slide presentation to Peggy to distribute to uh, all of you who, who have attended here today. Brian, there are no more questions in the chat. If anybody's got a quick question and you'd like to unmute, you're welcome to do that right now. Not seeing any. Brian, you were so thorough and there was so much detail. I think that people are just trying to soak all of it in. So thank you. Yeah, it's it's a lot. You know, I know it's overwhelming, especially if this is like your first exposure to pro standards, you may think this is just way too much. It, it is a lot. Um, but as you, you know, get more familiar with it, it does become more clear and all of the materials that we have on, on the Sierra website can, can help guide you through the process. I would say to anybody that's new, Brian is your resource extraordinaire and that checklist is going to be golden to you. Great. Well, thank you everyone for attending. Brian, thank you for doing such a wonderful job. And I will be following up with an email to everybody who registered with all of the meeting materials and then some of the links as well. So thank you for attending. Thanks everyone.